Right, well, good morning, everybody. Good to have you here today for our Open Bible Studio electives. This is actually a continuation of a continuation, and uh, we have been working on the Lord's coming wrath, and we did 7.0, and then we did 7.1 last time, and I didn't get it done, and so this is 7.2 on the Lord's coming wrath, and basically the topic that we've been discussing has been this one about what happens to the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we're dealing with the good so far. In other words, what happens to the good people, right, in regard to the Lord's coming wrath and how this will all play out. Uh, We discussed that there was a certain uh, definition, if you will, that I was trying to use of who good people are, because we kind of have to understand there are none good, right? There's none righteous, that kind of a thing. But when we look at this idea of who are the good people, then it certainly doesn't depend upon us. Okay, the good are those people who have been justified by Christ. Well, if you think about it, he died for all people. Okay, his blood was sufficient for all of humanity for all time. Okay, that's how great the blood of Jesus Christ is. However, not all of those people have faith in him. Okay, so not everybody is going to get into heaven, even though he did die for them. They will not accept. Some will not accept. So that's why I have here the good are those who have been justified by Christ of those who believe in Jesus. All right. So uh, before we get any further into this, we're going to do a lot of review, hopefully very fast, and we'll get into the remainder of the topic. And uh, let's go ahead and go to Lord in prayer first. And so, Father, for those of us that have trusted in Jesus, we come to you this morning just asking you to give us insight, uh, helping us to understand your word, for it to be very clear to us. And I know that I'm going to present something today that uh, I've not heard anybody else ever say. And so it's a question I've had in my mind, and some of the research that I've done uh, shows that there's a possibility for some of what I'm going to mention today. And so we'll uh, get there when we get there. Anyhow, Father, your will be done. Use me as your vessel to speak your words today. And may everybody's heart be here attentive and in tune with your spirit to know what I say that's right and what I say that's wrong And uh, ultimately, Lord, may we all be right in your spirit. And so we give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So the one thing that we've spoken about before is that good people have existed basically since the beginning of time, though not everybody was good. We go all the way back and we look at the, the children of Adam and Eve. One was Cain, one was Abel. Abel was the good guy. Right. And we know that he was the very first martyr that we see in Scripture killed by his brother Cain because Abel brought a proper and good, acceptable sacrifice to God, Cain didn't bring that kind of a sacrifice. But the good have been around since the very beginning of mankind. And we do see in Scripture that the good are resurrected from the dead or are raptured as living people before the Lord's wrath begins. So whenever God is going to begin that end time scenario where his wrath comes down, we know that the good people, again in Christ, are the ones who will be resurrected from the grave, caught up together, then we who are alive to meet the Lord in the air. Then the question, of course, was are there any other good people that God shows us uh, in that end time scenario? When you consider that everybody's been resurrected or raptured, are there any other good people? Well, if they were in Christ then the answer basically is no at that moment in time. However, the answer is also sort of, all right? Sort of. There are some other good people who do come uh, shortly after that, and so we're going, or in a time period after that, and so that's what we're going to be talking about again as we kind of recap here. And so there are additional good people. I'm just calling them the goods. You got the bads and you got the uglies, right? So these are the goods. Right? We know that the goods were raptured or resurrected, and now after that, in the time period of God's wrath now, right? you don't want to be here then, so you better come to faith in Christ now. It's that simple. Right? But in that time of God's wrath, either at that moment that the rapture occurs, when there's nobody left on the earth that is good, at that moment some become good, or some come to faith in those days, year, or two years after that rapture has occurred. And we can see that in Revelation chapter 7 as we start in verse 2. And again, this is recap, and so I've kind of abbreviated some of these verses. Um, If you want to go look there, you can, Revelation chapter 7, or you can look up here on the screen 
And a lot of this, like I said, is going to be just recap from last two weeks. But we know that we see that at this moment in time where the rapture is going to occur, that there is the resurrection, there is the rapture, there's a great multitude that shows up in heaven, but there's an angel that shows up on the scene there, and it's an angel who um, is ascending from the east and having the seal of the living God. And that angel with that seal, what he does is he ends up sealing the servants of God in their foreheads. Now, keep in mind the rapture has occurred. So there are going to be servants who are going to be sealed. The rapture has occurred. There are no good people on the earth, and yet there are some who are going to be sealed. And so God has chosen certain people, I would suggest. They're religious in some fashion. They know the true God in some fashion, but maybe they haven't completely developed that understanding. And now that the rapture has occurred, now that Christ has come, now that this moment in time has occurred, now they fully understand, perhaps. And so they're going to be sealed in their forehead with the seal of God. So we have here, then, in this scenario, where there's an angel who has the seal of the living God, and he's told to hold all the other angelic beings that are supposed to hurt the earth, hold them back, until we've sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And then we see that there's a number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Okay, so now, think about what we've just read. Okay, I'm going to run it back real quickly. There's an angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and that angel says, Hurt not the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Right? And then we hear the number of them which were sealed, 144,000, of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Everybody with me? Okay, so now here's my question for you. In what we've just read, what is the gender of those people who are sealed? In what we've just read, what is the gender? Have we read anything regarding gender? No, no right? All right, so now, this is a question that I've had for a long, long time. I've been told, well, I'll get to that in just a minute, all right? So again, um, in what we've read, what's the gender? This passage does not say anything regarding gender. What it does say specifically, though, is that these people are blood relatives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay? From the 12 tribes, 144,000 is 12,000 from the 12 tribes, of Israel. So they are blood relatives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's another scene on the same event in chapter 14 in the book of Revelation. So we're going to look at this from a different point of view. In Revelation chapter 14, and we start in verse 1, and this is the scene now not seen by John from heaven looking down, but now seen by John on earth and watching what happens on earth. And so as we go into this scene, then we see that John looks and lo, a lamb the Lamb would be Jesus, standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000. Same people <clears throat> that were mentioned in chapter 7. Having his Father's name written on their foreheads. In chapter 7, they were about to be sealed. In this one, they're already sealed. It's just a transition in a moment in time. Before they were sealed, after they're sealed. Before they were sealed, the rapture had occurred, and there's a great multitude that chose in heaven. They're down there on Mount Zion, and now they are sealed. Okay, so they've got their, father, their father's name or his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters. This is what they're hearing on earth about what's going on in heaven. The voice of many waters. Imagine, have you ever been to a waterfall? How thunderous the sound is when you get there and you're talking to your friends. You're having to yell back and forth because it's so loud. Well, this is on earth. What they are hearing is this thunderous activity, whatever it may be that's going on in heaven. So the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. So, of course, you know, in Spanish, the word is relampago. You know, I mean, it's just kaboom, you know. Um, and, you know, the lightning and the thunder that goes with it. And so they also hear, though, the voice of harpers harping with their harps. So there's music involved. So it's not just chaotic, ugly sounds, but it's like there's a great multitude of people that are celebrating, that are glorifying the Lord, and that are also singing songs of praise and joy, why would they be doing that? Because they were just resurrected or they were just raptured. And so these people on earth 
are hearing that. Who are the people that are listening? The 144,000 who were sealed on their foreheads just a moment before. Okay, and it says then, and they sung, talking about those in heaven, sang as it were a new song before the throne. That's how we know it's in heaven, because they're before the throne of God in heaven. And before the four beasts, there are four angelic beings that are around the throne. And the elders, there are elders, that's angelic beings also, that surround the throne. Right? Keep in mind, here's God on his throne, Jesus is there. Well, no, Jesus on the Mount of Olives, isn't he? He's down on, on the earth, okay? And so here, though, we've got the four angelic beings, we've got the, 20, or the, uh, the elders that are around, and it says here that no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Okay, no man. So now some people say, well, you see, that's there. This is talking about men now, right? Well, if you look in the Strong's Concordance and you look at the definitions and things like that, that terminology of no man actually is translated no one or nothing. Okay, so in this case, it's, and no one could learn the song. It's not gender specific. Okay, so so far we've seen nothing that identifies the gender of the 144,000 people. Okay, and we know that these are redeemed from the earth. Okay, so it's referring then to all of humanity, not just, well, it's just redeemed from all of humanity. And so that terminology of um, redeemed from the earth doesn't have any gender associated with it either. Okay? So I'm back to what I was going to say earlier. I've always wondered, why do we say that it's only men? Okay? I mean, I think I even saw some of you move your mouths over here saying, it's men. Right? Well, why do we say that? And so as we continue to look, here we see that it's talking about uh, no man could learn the song, okay? but it's talking about no one or nothing could learn the song. Okay, and these are redeemed from the earth. It's from all of humanity. And in verse 4, it goes on there, and it says, And these are they, the, they is a generic term, which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Ah. Now we go, ah, maybe this is an aha moment. All right, they are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they, again, the generic terminology, which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth, these were redeemed from among men, but talking about humanity, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. So the only place where we would come up with something that would specifically say that they are men, not talking about humanity now, but specifically talking about men, we would say, oh, they're not defiled with women. Right? And so that appears to be the first apparent genuine gender reference there when we say that they are not defiled with women. And so we would then kind of come to the conclusion that it's talking about men. Well, wait a minute, what society do we live in today? I mean, just because it says that they're not defiled with women, does it mean that it's men? No, not in this society. So, it could possibly be just saying that, well, I don't know, the context here, though, is what I'm looking at. What kind of a context? Is it just talking about sex? Is that what that's about, really? No, this is about following Jesus, isn't it? Okay, and by following Jesus, that's, that's a faith movement. That's a, a heart movement. That's a spirit thing, isn't it? It's not a physical thing. And so... These are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Can you have female virgins? Yes. Can you have male virgins? Yes. Now it just says they're not defiled with women. And so, again, though, when I look at this idea of um, they're redeemed from among men, again, using that word men, is it referring to men, men? No, it's talking about this is a human. Okay, it could be a male or a female. So it's not gender specific there. So at this point, I'm coming up with a lot of non-gender specific terminologies other than they were not defiled with women, which is specifically talking about women, for they are virgins. And so the first fruits, is that terminology of first fruits gender specific? Can you have women that are first fruits and men that are first fruits? Sure you can. It's not gender specific. So no, it's not gender specific. And so let me put a bug in your ear. Okay, I'm just going to put a bug in your ear. You can do with this what you want. But I've been looking at this, 
And, and I've actually added this material to what I had previously because I just am not entirely convinced that it's only men. Okay? And I'm, I'm giving, <laughs> here I am, I'm giving God allowance to have some women there. <laughs> All right? Sounds very arrogant of me, doesn't it? All right, I just want to make sure, though, that if, if women are supposed to be included in that group, can they be? And if they are supposed to be included in that group, then I want to make sure that we know personally that it's possible that it's not only 144,000 men, okay? I think this is also accidentally the month of, of women or something like that. I don't know. There's a National Women's Day was the other day or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Granted, okay, this text could be referring to the traditional view that it's 144,000 males. It could be. I'm not denying that. I'm not trying to change anything. If you want to believe that, great, go ahead. It doesn't change anything, okay? But the question then, of course, and I've got this cue there, the question then, of course, is, is it possible that it could include females as well? Okay, and again, like I say, I'm not being adamant here, but I've got a capital B-U-T, all right? But if we look at the context of that end times, okay, the context of that end times, is it a possibility? And let's go into, you know, the passages in Scripture about the seven churches in the book of Revelation? The seven churches, we basically start chapters one through three, talks about the seven churches. So let's go and look at that because context there is important too. In Revelation chapter two and starting verse 18, then we see that this is written to the church in Thyatira. Now let me ask you, is the church in Thyatira entirely men? No. So when we're talking about a church, it's male and it's female, correct? It's adults and it's children. Okay, so we have then, unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, or the messenger to the church in Thyatira, these things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, talking about the whole church, not just the men, the whole church and your charity, and service, and faith, and, their, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. In other words, your works are going to be even more than what you started out with. Verse 20, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. Okay, you're putting up with that woman Jezebel. Okay, you're, you're allowing this woman Jezebel to be amongst you. You're allowing this woman Jezebel, well, it says here, that calls herself to be a prophetess. You're allowing her to teach you. You're allowing her to give you material and information that is not of God. You're tolerating her, and you shouldn't be. In essence, you're participating with her, but you shouldn't be. Okay? Thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants. Are they all men? Are they all women? Combination, right? And so here we have this woman who is seducing the church. This woman is seducing the men, the women, the children of the church. To what? To commit fornication. So now what have they done? They've left the true teacher, Jesus. They've left the truth and now are participating in what God is calling fornication. So they've left the truth and they've gone after the false. This is men and women both. This is children. Whoever's listening to the teaching and not abiding by Scripture now are committing, oh, wait a minute, if they stayed with the truth, they would be considered virgins of truth. But now they've left that, and they've become violated by untruth. You see what I'm saying? Right? So they're no longer virgins anymore, are they? They're no longer pure in the Word of God, are they? Now they're defiled, aren't they? I, I don't want to... I don't want to force this idea, but I'm trying to develop this idea so that you can see that that reference that we were reading where it talks about that they're not defiled with women could be indicating that they're actually not defiled. 
spiritually. See what I'm saying? That they stayed with the truth. Maybe they didn't understand everything, but they weren't defiled. They were standing upon the Word of God. They didn't have the full understanding of the Word of God. They were still in the truth. And then they met the Lord. Okay, that was the good thing. But this Jezebel here, which this is talking about an end time scenario here, okay? Suffers that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And that's a violation there of the spiritual relationship, of the spiritual worship. You're now taking part in false worship of the true God. Does that make sense? False worship, actually, of an untrue God. So you're no longer pure anymore. You've been violated. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication. So she's also involved in this fornication. And she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her. Adultery is a little different than fornication. Fornication is just basically what we would understand as being sex out of wedlock. Okay? Adultery would be sex not with your partner, but with somebody else while you're married. You understand the difference between the two? All right? Regardless whether you were, well, both situations are bad. And it's all because of this one woman that they are becoming defiled. They're no longer virgins because they have participated in the fornication and in the adultery with her. Into great, and they're going to be put into great tribulation, except... God is a God of second chances. They repent of their deeds. And then he would wash that sin away. He says, I will kill her children with death. And that's not only physical death, that's spiritual death. Keep in mind, end time scenario, God is going to wipe out all unbelievers. Okay, that's a serious death death there. Okay, they'll be cast into hell. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. So will you be pure? Will you be a virgin spiritually and follow only after the truth of God? Or will you follow after this other woman that causes you to participate in fornication, that causes you to participate in adultery against the true God? That's what I see in that passage. We continue to read in verse 24. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira... As many as have not this doctrine. Okay, in other words, he was talking to all you bad guys. All right? We're not talking about the bad right now. We're talking about the good. So now these are the good. As many as have not this doctrine of Jezebel. As many as are not participating in the spiritual fornication. In the spiritual adultery. Okay, unto you and which have not known the depths of Satan. You've been spiritually virgins in your relationship with God. You haven't sought something else. As they say, or as they speak, I will put upon you none of the burden. Remain a virgin. Remain true to the faith of the true God. Don't follow after this woman who causes you to participate in spiritual fornication, spiritual adultery. But that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. Till I come. This is what's happening just before the Lord is going to return. All right, so there are people who are going to be, well, remember, we saw that the resurrection and the rapture occurred. And these are people who are virgins, have not followed after Jezebel, however, didn't have the whole story. Now they meet the Lord, they're sealed on their foreheads. And this is where it says, which ye have already, hold fast till I come. They held fast to the, fast to the biblical truth the best they understood it, and then they met the Lord, and then they were sealed with his seal. Revelation chapter 17 goes on, and it uh, carries on that same thing. It's talking about here, uh, whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, or, or with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. You'll recall that there is this woman riding on the beast, right? And it's a religious system that's riding on uh, the empire that Satan has going at that particular time. And so this woman who's on this beast has caused mankind to participate in going away from God. And so the kings of the earth have participated, have committed fornication. And, the, and by the way, is that male or female? This says kings. It's the leaders of the rulers, okay? The leaders of the rulers of the earth. Uh, do we have any female rulers of countries? Absolutely we do, okay? 
Though she would be called a queen, she's still also the ruler or the leader of that country. Okay, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk in the wine of her fornication. So worldwide, there's going to be people following after this false religion. Okay, they are leaving the truth, and they're no longer virgins in that relationship. They followed after this woman. They've partaken in what this woman has to offer. Revelation chapter 18 also says, talk, talking about the same thing, says, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Same concept, the same idea. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And the kings of the earth, who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. And we know that the Lord is going to end up destroying this mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Okay? There's a, a city involved with that as well, and that's an, for another time. And it says, And the kings of the earth, who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. And then that brings us back to our text. Okay? So we're going to the next verse now, but do you see how I'm suggesting that it's possible that the 144,000 could be male and female, but these are all people specifically from the 12 tribes of Israel, and these are all people who had the knowledge of the truth of Scripture, who were not given over to false religion, and then they were sealed by the Lord. Whether it's the 144,000 males, if God wants to do that, that's fine. Okay? If it's combination male and female, if God wants to do that, that's fine as well. I think that there's room to where it could also include women up there on the Mount of Olives when that happens. All right, so again, this is the scene from Earth, Revelation 14, and picking up in verse 5. And their mouth, or in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. They've lived the good life, okay? They've kept the faith to the best of their knowledge. They meet the Lord, the Savior. They're washed clean of their sins because we all have them, but they are without fault, all right? God holds no fault for them. So these are the people that are redeemed from among men, generic humanity. They're the first fruits, no gender associated with that terminology, and they are the newly added goods, okay? These are good people that are added right there at that moment, where the rapture's already occurred, they're left behind, 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, so these people specifically, though, like I said, are blood relatives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, we pick it up then in verse 6 as we continue. And I saw another angel, so we've already got the, the one that sealed everybody. And so they're now on that Mount of Olives, and now we see another angel that flies in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. Okay, this is to everybody now. And we know that because it says, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So all unsaved people now will hear this gospel message from this angelic being. Along with that gospel message, there's another angel flying in the midst of heaven. Uh, let's see here. I'm sorry, that was to the Gentiles of the world. Okay, when we're talking about nations and kindreds and tongues. And then we go on here as we pick it up here. This other angel then saying, Babylon has fallen. This is this this economic system that, that is there, this religious system that is there, the female riding on the back of the beast kind of a thing. Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Again, they're participating in this false religion. They're no longer virgins, these people. They're following it. But this angel is saying, but she's fallen now. This religious system, this structure is dead. Stay away from that. And then there's a third angel that follows along as well, saying, if any man worships the beast and his image, that's talking about uh, the Antichrist, that's talking about Satan, that's talking about um, the image that's placed into the temple of the Jewish people at the time. And again, this is another study on that topic. And receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. Now this is the mark of the beast, as they say. Keep in mind now, you had 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel that were sealed with a mark. Right? The seal of the living God. Well, Satan is trying to copy that, if you will. And he's trying to seal his own people. And those are people that he's trying to get to come away from being spiritual virgins and to join his team. And he's trying to seal them on their foreheads or in their hands. But it says, though, that if they take that mark, they shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. And so they will be doomed if they take that mark of the beast. 
Verse 11 goes on and it says, The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image. So there are some that will worship the beast in his image. There are some that will take the mark. But this also then implies that there are some that won't take the mark. Okay? And whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now here is the patience of the saints. Now, in other words, saints are going to have to bear up. Wait a minute, what saints? Well, we know we got 144,000, but we also know the gospel angel has gone and pre- preached the word to the whole world now. Some people will hear that, and they will come to faith. Didn't we read, though, that he was going to wash them from their sins? I mean, okay, in other words, those things will be forgiven them that they've done. And I'm kind of paraphrasing here a little bit, but what we've just gotten done reading. And so here now, these people heard the gospel angel. They know that Babylon is, is gone. They know, don't take the mark of the beast. If they take the mark of the beast, they're doomed. So anybody who is caught and doesn't have the mark of the beast will be told, take the mark of the beast. And if they say no, in essence, that's their statement of faith because they know they're doomed to die at man's hand, but God has a greater promise waiting for them in the days ahead, or the moments ahead. So they will literally be beheaded. We see that in Scripture in the book of Revelation. And so... It's saying, though, that here's the patience of the saints. These saints now, these that came to faith, oh, these are good people, aren't they? They've come to faith. These are more good people that have been added because they heard the gospel message. All from all the tribes, all the nations, all the tongues, and all the people. And how do we know that? Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And so we've got some more good people that are added after the rapture and the resurrection. We got 144,000 that were added, right? And now we've got these people that were added as well. These are more of those good people. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. So this is people that die after the resurrection and the rapture, after those three angelic beings have gone across the face of the earth. Anybody who dies in the Lord from this point on will be blessed. Okay, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from now on, henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. So there will be some who will be caught, who will not take the mark of the beast, who will die because they will be beheaded, but that's not a problem because they will be resurrected. Revelation chapter 20 talks about that resurrection. Okay, so anyhow. Those who die in the Lord from henceforth are also newly added goods. Okay, newly added goods. Why are they added? Because they heeded the gospel message. Okay, because they rejected Babylon. Okay, because they refused the mark of the beast. Okay, these are the the, the criteria that they have to have. Now, as we move forward in that time, though, it does become harder and harder and harder to accept Christ as your Savior. Okay, so keep in mind, this is during the trumpet judgments. This is right after the resurrection and the rapture has occurred. We've got these angelic beings, and now the trumpets start to sound. And so people who are on the earth, who have heard those three messages, have got to make a choice. And in the first four trumpet judgments, basically the thing that happens is God is bringing out his wrath upon the earth, more of the physical earth as opposed to humanity. Okay, you can go back and look at those yourself. Okay, the fifth trumpet, though, that's those scorpion-like beasts that start biting. You know what I'm talking about? Scorpion-like beasts, they can bite. Nobody can die when they get bitten by these things, and they can bite for five months. Five months being bitten by these things, and nobody's going to die. They're going to wish they could die, but they're not going to be dying. Okay, and so then we get to the sixth angel, though, and this is where now hearts really start to harden. So we've got the first four up to the fifth trumpet, And now we're talking to the sixth angel which had the trumpet. This is the sixth trumpet. And so now it's really getting intense. Okay, By these three things, by these three means, are a third part of men killed. They're killed by fire. They're killed by smoke. They're killed by brimstone which which issued out of the mouths of some riders and some beasts that were on the earth at that time. Okay, Now, that sounds terrible, and it is. And here's what happens, though. Mankind, instead of turning to God, here's where now the hearts are starting to shut off. Keep in mind, this is the sixth seal. The next one is the seventh seal, which now opens the bowls. 
Okay, so the seventh seal is when the Lord comes and takes possession of the earth. So this is like their last chance. And so we're up the very wall before now God brings down these bold judgments, which will literally wipe out all of unbelieving mankind. Okay, God has given them the first five seals, more pressure, more pressure, not seals, but four, uh, trumpets. Okay, more pressure, more pressure, more pressure, more pressure. And here we are then at this sixth one, and it talks about the rest of the men that were not killed by these plagues. Okay, so what did we say? There was a bunch of them that were killed. How many? A third part were killed by fire, by smoke. How many does that leave over? At least two-thirds, right? So two-thirds of mankind at this point in time that were not killed by the plagues. Oh, wait a minute. People who have come to faith will not be bitten, will not be affected by those plagues because those are God's wrath. Okay, a person who comes to faith after the rapture will not be affected by God's wrath, but that doesn't mean they won't be affected by Satan's wrath. Remember, it was talking about those who died in the Lord. Those who die in the Lord are caught by Satan, by Antichrist, and they're killed because of their faith. But here now, this is talking about unbelieving mankind. So the rest of men that were not killed, so two-thirds of unbelieving mankind that was left, yet repented not of their works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. And now the Lord comes and takes possession of the earth. And now in the next 30 days, God brings down those bold judgments and wipes out all of these people who are, no, who are not believers. He doesn't wipe out his own, who have come to faith, who haven't taken the mark of the beast. I keep showing my left hand. I should show my right hand. Okay? Um, he hasn't wiped out his people, those of his that are in the grave, because they died after the resurrection rapture. They will be brought back to life again in Revelation chapter 20. Okay, now, let's go look in Revela excuse me, Zechariah in chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12, and we're going to start in verse 2. And now I'm going to talk about more goods, okay, more good people. And as we look at these goods or these good people that are coming to faith here, behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. Jerusalem was about to be destroyed, was about to be wiped out. Matter of fact, the armies of the world came against Jerusalem at this, in this point in history, in the end times. The armies of the world came and they, they violated Jerusalem. Okay, they hauled a bunch of them off into slavery. They were ravaged, they were pillaged, the women were raped, the houses were destroyed. Think about now not just the wall part of Jerusalem, but think about the whole city of Jerusalem as the armies are closing in, closing in, closing in over a year, year and a half, however long it takes for this to happen. All right? Then the Lord finally says, okay, that's it, I've had it. I'm tired of my people Jerusalem, in Jerusalem in particular all right, being destroyed I need to have a remnant of some kind. I know I've got the 144,000. There are other Jewish people around the world that have come to faith. They've also heard the gospel message. They will be among those good people as well. right? And so now, behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. So God's mind about Jerusalem now, whom he's always loved, now is dedicated to them being saved from the wrath of Satan and also, if they haven't already come to faith, and I would suggest to you by this time they probably have, okay, they would be coming to faith in the Lord. And uh, so here we go. It says, And I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about. No, let me back up. At this moment in time, they haven't come to the Lord. Okay, they haven't come to the Lord, but they will shortly. We'll get to it here. So I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. So God's mind now has changed toward Jerusalem. Unto the people all round about, so those that are coming from around Jerusalem, now they will begin to tremble because of Jerusalem. When they shall say, uh, shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. So the region of Judah and the city of Jerusalem being surrounded by all these armies, suddenly God comes in their behalf. And in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. So just like every nation of the world has members of their army there to do what they can to destroy Jerusalem. Why? Because they are partaking in the false religion. They are partaking in the kingdom of Satan. Okay? They are not virgins, right? They are fornicating with Satan, fornicating uh, committing adultery with Satan in the passages that we read in the book of Revelation chapter 2 there. 
that we saw earlier. Okay, so in verse uh, 4 then, it goes on and it says, In that day saith the Lord, I will smite every horse, this is the armies now, with astonishment, and his rider with madness. And I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah. This is what I'm saying now. The Lord's focus, the Lord's attention now is changing to not just the whole world, but more specifically toward Jerusalem and Judah. And I will smite every horse of the people with blindness. Again, these are the enemies that are coming against. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in the Lord of hosts their God. So even the rulers now of Jerusalem and of Judah will realize that God has given them supernatural strength to go and fight and to defend themselves. And in that day will I make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood, like a torch of fire in a sheaf, and they shall devour all the people round about. How, what, a, what an amazing story this is. You remember the account where uh, there was an army out there and next thing you know, a couple of guys go out and they find out that 185,000 of them are dead overnight. What happened? They turned their swords against each other. They turned against each other, they destroyed each other. Well, this is the kind of thing that's going to happen. Here you've got whoever's left in Jerusalem that's being surrounded by this army. It's like they're going to pick up a sword and they're going to say, hey, let's go and have some fun. You know, and they're going to start to defend themselves. They shall devour all the people round about on the right hand and on the left, and Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. That's a good statement. Okay, people were being brought out, people were being killed, people were being taken for slavery. Now people can come back, and it'll be a good thing, and she will again flourish in the days ahead. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first. That the oh, uh, let's see here, who comes from the tribe of Judah? The Lord Jesus, doesn't he? From the family line of King David, right? And so the Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. The Lord Jesus from the tribe of Judah, also from the family line of King David. That's why he is authorized to be the king of the people of Israel. Verse 8, in that day, end times day, shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them in that day shall be as David. And David was a warrior, wasn't he? He was a great warrior in his day. And the house of David shall be as God. It will appear as if they have that kind of a strength and ability. It's as if they are God. As the angel of the Lord before them. The angel of the Lord, you remember in the wilderness wandering, they had the pillar of fire and the pillar of smoke, you know, during the day and during the night. And um, they were walled off from the Egyptian army because the angel of the Lord was there fighting on their behalf. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem in that day, that end time scenario in the day ahead. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. Here's where they get saved. Okay, here's where they get saved. Earlier on, they were recognizing who God was. They were realizing that he is truly God. It's almost as if now they're leaving their adultery and their fornication and they're coming back and wishing that they could be you know, virgins again, if that makes any sense. Okay, but they're coming now and realizing who he is. And then this is where now the spirit of grace, for by grace are you saved. See, you couldn't be saved if God didn't extend his grace to you. We're enemies of the Lord until he extends his grace to us. Okay, that's the empowerment that God gives you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Okay, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13, I think it is. All right, so here now God extends his grace, the same grace that you were able to accept Christ as your Savior. He extends his grace to these people and spirit of supplications. And basically he's saying, so now will you finally come to me? Will you finally come? Accept me as your Savior. Whoa, what a great day. What a great day. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. This is Jesus talking here. They're going to look upon me, Jesus, whom they've pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And so basically this is identifying that we killed our only son. This always makes me weep. And they'll be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. The next chapter, it continues as we get into chapter 13, uh, just very briefly in verse 1 here. And uh, we see that it says, And in that day there shall be a fountain opened, 
to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And so here these people now will be washed of their sins and they are more goods that are added to the family of God. So now these are specifically saved Jewish people there that we can tell they're in Jerusalem. Okay, Their houses have been ravaged and been raped and violated and all the other stuff that's gone on. But we would suggest to you that these are now from the tribe of Judah, the region of Judah at least, and the family of David, or that area where David would have resided. Basically, we're going to call them Jewish people. Okay, They've been holed up in that city of Jerusalem. Okay, So now here in Zechariah chapter 14, we've got some more of this as we'll pursue it. And we see here, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken. And the houses rifled. This is what I was mentioning to you a moment ago. It's just out of order here. And the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue, the rest of the people, shall not be cut off from the city. So the rest of them will remain there in Jerusalem, somehow being overrun, but at the same time, finding a way to defend themselves until the Lord finally comes and gives them that strength that they need to go out on the left and on the right and to take um, their own nation, their own city back. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. So here now, you're, if you're standing in Jerusalem and you're looking toward the east, you've got the Mount of Olives over there. The Mount of Olives is going to split. Part of the mountain is going to go north, part of the mountain is going to go south, and there's going to be a, a ravine or a crevasse that's going to be formed there, which is going to run east and west. Okay? And it says here that ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach, reach to Azal. Some people speculate specifically where Azal is. It's not necessarily important, but if you'll get down in there, if you'll get into this crevasse that the Lord has provided, you shall flee like as you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee, and it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall be not be clear nor dark. So now, can you think of a point in time where light is going to be changed? Okay, where there's going to be some cosmic event that is going to change the way things are on the earth. If you look, the sixth seal, there's a cosmic sign in the sun, the moon, and the stars. The sun goes away. The stars go away. The moon goes away. It's pitch black. But then the glory of the Lord comes as the Lord is coming to, well, to resurrect and to rapture and to seal the 144,000. In that day, the Lord's glory is what is going to light up that place, that time. Okay? And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, basically no day or night at that point, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that an even time shall be light. So it seems to me that this is talking about an event that's going to occur when the Lord returns. Wait, the mountain's going to be torn north to, north to south. There's going to be a crevasse that's opened up there. 144,000 Jewish people, okay, well, uh, tribes of Israel, are going to be sealed. But if people will get into that crevasse and they will run, they will be taken care of, it seems. They'll flee into there, won't it? Okay, so there's a multitude of things that are happening at that moment in time. And that shall be in that day that, okay, and then I think that now from verse 7 to verse 8, there's a transition in time. In that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, half of them toward the hinder sea, in summer and in winter shall it be. Now, it's possible that this could also happen at that same moment in time, though. So water would go down into that crevasse as well. Why? A bunch of people are fleeing. And if the Lord is going to take care of them, what do they need? They need water, don't they? What are they going to eat? They need food, which are found on plants. And so this water potentially could be going down into that crevasse at the same time. So there could be a transition time or could not be a transition in time here. But anyhow, shall be in that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. So it's just going to continue to run. And it says here then that uh, the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. 
shall there be one Lord and his name one. So some timing issues. We'll figure those out when we get there someday. Okay, some options there though that I tried to explain to you just now. Okay, Zechariah verse 10 then goes on and it says, And the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. And it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate unto the place of the first gate, unto the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananiel unto the king's wine presses. And this is why I would suggest that it's possibly not at the point where the crevasse is formed because it sounds to me like this is more at the end where now the Lord has come and he's going to make the, the land rich again and it's going to produce again and there's going to be great blessing in this plain that's there which right now would be a wilderness okay and it says here that men shall dwell in it and there shall be no more utter destruction but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited that's again part of why I'm saying that it's probably later on in time that's why there might be a transition between verse 7 and verse 8 okay as we look at verse 12 then and this shall be the plague wherewith this is how the unbelievers are going to be dealt with shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. Their eyes shall consume away in their holes. And their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. Well, keep in mind, the Lord has given ample opportunity for people to be saved. Okay, you've got those trumpet judgments, like I said. All the way up until the sixth trumpet judgment, they've got the opportunity, but then we see that their hearts become so hardened, they blaspheme God. Okay, they curse His name. He then takes possession of the earth and all you have left are the bowls. 30 days from what we understand, those bowls are going to wipe out all of mankind and this is part of the way that that will happen. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them and they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. That's like that army, 185,000. They destroyed themselves as they fought against themselves in the night and it says here and judah also shall fight at jerusalem and the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together gold and silver and apparel in her great or in great abundance which again zechariah talking about how they all are able to go and fight on the right and on the left okay? and so shall be the plague of the horse of the mule of the camel and of the ass and of all the beasts that shall be in these tents as this plague and it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of the nations which came against Jerusalem. So now this is telling me that there are some people that are left over. Okay, all these nations that came against Jerusalem, God was going to wipe out, wasn't he? Okay, but wait a minute, there are some that are left. Who would be left of all of those nations? People that came to faith, right? He's not going to wipe out his own people. There's going to be lots of people that are hiding trying to not be caught so they don't have to take the mark of the beast. They're going to be barely surviving some of these. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah, the Lord of hosts. And keep the feast of tabernacles. You see, I knew this was going to happen. I've got too much material again. So we're going to have to continue with the good. Uh, I will not review the next time. Okay, so we're going to pick this up in Revelation chapter 12 the next time. As we look for more good people, again, this is not good because of their own deeds. This is good because of what the Lord has done for them. The salvation that Christ provides through his death, his burial, his resurrection. The faith that they have come to, to where now whatever sin they had has been washed away. Right? Not because of their own good deeds, but only because of what the Lord has done and the provision that He has made. Okay, so there are other references to these good people that we'll talk about as we pick this up in Revelation chapter 12. Very interesting passage. We'll also get into some material in Isaiah chapter 66, which is also very, very fascinating. So um, next time it'll be uh, what happens to the good, the bad, and the ugly, part 7.3. Da, 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 da. All right, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Oh, Father God, we thank you so much for the, for the patience of these saints. As your word just has so much material in it and so much that can be said, we thank you, Lord, that um, you allow us to read it, that you allow us to discover it, even question it. Uh, hopefully, Lord, that what I've said here today is, is right and is true, and where it's not, then I'm sure 
without a doubt that you will reveal the truth in your good time. And so uh, I know that as we leave here, there are lots of things going on in our country right now. Help us to be level-headed. Help us to be safe. Help us to be healthy. And uh, help us to feel your presence in these days ahead. So, Lord, I thank you for these things and pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at 1-888-888. 7819466 Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.